And our second speaker is Mrs. Sharda Murlidran, who is an officer with the Indian Administrative Service and is currently Principal Secretary for Local Self-Government with the Government of Kerala. And Mrs. Murlidran has uh, previously served as the Executive Director of of Kudumbashree, which is Kerala's flagship program for women's empowerment and poverty eradication. And she's also had a stint with the central government in New Delhi uh, with the Panchayati Raj Ministry, which is a local government uh, ministry. Murli uh, you know, Kerala has a strong historical track record of well-functioning local governments. And if you could make your remarks, putting that in context, and then speaking about the specific role of local governments. Uh, Professor Epin alluded to some of those. I you know, read this incredible statistic a few days ago about how all the local governments at one point of time were running you know, some 1,300 community kitchens and in a span of some 45 days managed to serve a total of 8.6 million individuals. And many of these were run in coordination with with Kudumbashri, a program that you managed uh, some years ago. And further linked to the point that Professor Eben made about Kerala already had local sort of disaster management plans in place. Uh, and you know that further bolstered your relief um, efforts. So ma'am, the floor is yours to sort of elaborate on these aspects as well as other issues. Thank you. I would like to start with just responding to a question I saw in, in between, which is about what are the figures really? I mean, what is it that makes, uh, um, what is it about Kerala? So let me just give the figures as on date. I don't have the exact figures, but we have about, um, we were the first state in the country to be hit by um, the coronavirus. It's um, the end of January. So for us, we are right now entering our fifth month of handling of tackling this virus and it has come in three waves so far the first wave um, end of january to um, to early february got over very quickly it was very limited and we were able to control it then came a um, then we had international arrivals um, bringing um, the virus and um, soon the numbers um, got to escalate so but we had reached a point of about 500 cases um, the interesting thing again um, at that point of time we started as being the only state and then slowly other states started joining in um, Delhi and Mumbai um, the cities started coming in at, at that point of time we were leaders in numbers as far as COVID um, the number of COVID positive cases was gone now what has been also interesting about Kerala has been the very low rate of um, fatalities. Um, we had, when it was 500 cases, we had four fatalities, uh, three to four fatalities. So this was, this is the scenario till the 4th of May. And then after, after uh, the 4th of May, when the lockdown was released, was relaxed considerably and international and domestic um, travel was allowed, the numbers just shot up again in Kerala. So the, uh, in this, while over uh, three and a half months, we had about 500 cases. Now in the span of two, three weeks, we've had another 500 plus cases that have come in. And uh, the majority of them, over 90% of these cases are actually cases which have come to us from other places, from either the rest of the country or from abroad, um, carrying the virus. And the contact cases inside the state um, is um, fairly small. So the, the number active of the num active cases, we've got about 70, which are, um, which are contact, which have uh, come out of, um, connect with the people who had the virus. So that's the, that's the context and uh, the number of deaths has now gone up to eight or so. So why and how did Kerala manage? What was its strategy? What was different about it? Um, I would like to put an immediate context to um, how the strategy of management has been. And uh, one immediate context, one very important learning for Kerala, I mean, it's been about its lived experience. And the first lived experience that played a vital role in how Kerala responded to this pandemic was Nipah. Um, you know, in 2018, we had a horrible uh, Nipah outbreak 
in which the fatality rate was about 78%. You know, we need to contrast that with uh, two or three percent of Corona. So it was, it was some, it just came out of the blue. We didn't know how to handle it. But learning from NEPA, what Kerala, actually the health system of Kerala learned to fine tune the art of contact tracing. It was about identifying, isolating, intense monitoring and aggressive containment. Now, this was a strategy that NIPA uh, really created a protocol for Kerala. And uh, this is a, I mean, of course, there were a lot of learnings from the WHO um, guidelines as well. But this was something that was activated almost as soon, immediately upon, um, upon the first case of corona get, being detected. This is one context. Another context is the disaster management plans. Now, in 2018, when the big floods hit Kerala, you know, once in a century floods, we were completely unprepared. Uh, of course, there was a strong response and that the local governments also were, the, the fact that you had very strong local governments on the ground helped the response. But even then, there was quite a bit of chaos and disorganization and, and also lack of appreciation of what to do of, uh, you know, of what were our fallback um, support systems that were available, where do you hunt for rope or boats or machines uh, to clear things up. So with that, with that in mind, um, you know, when the Rebuild Kerala initiative was put out, one of the initiatives that the state government did um, was to say that in the annual planning exercise of local governments, let us bring in a disaster, a community-led disaster management plan. Of course, locating it in the last year of the um, of the elected governments in Kerala, we had uh, um, we were interested also in uh, jogging the community memory of the lived experience, so that we could take lessons from that and incorporate that into our uh, disaster identification of vulnerable communities. Looking at uh, relief operations and also looking at what should be mitigation. Um, interventions. Um, we also did, but um, you know, created out of this uh, out of this exercise, we created documents, and these documents had a complete inventorization of human resources at the local level. It also had uh, an inventorization of the infrastructure. So, from JCBs to boats to pickaxes, uh, you know, you had to uh, who had uh, uh, yards of rope to. Uh, provide to x-ray machines, ventilators, ICUs, who are they, who are the contacts, what are the details. So that in that information was actually in place. Um, so out of our thousand odd local governments, at least 800 of them had documents with them, which, with, which had done a proper inventorization, had the contact details of the people of, of emergency response teams were also identified and uh, their contacts, etc., were available with them. A third interesting thing is, and again, which is completely unrelated, the government this year uh, in its budget announcement came out with a 12 point program for local governments. And interestingly, that included um, budget hotels, Janikiya hotels, they call them, by, to be operated by Kudumbashri, which would serve uh, food at, uh, um, at very um, affordable rates and would also have a provision of providing free food for people who cannot afford to. Uh, pay, which would be raised through sponsorships. They had a scheme which was looking at elderly care. They also had the local economic assurance program, which was saying that one in five families, uh, one member out of five, um, we should be targeting looking at employment opportunities. So from the primary productive sector to MSMEs, uh, that initiative and that push had already been there. So, so this was the back, backdrop um, against which we are entering the COVID phase. So when COVID hit us, um, you know, it's it was very easy to locate local self governments in an augmented role um, for co for COVID response coming out of previous experience and also going through the whole process of training, understanding. Uh, and working on uh, what should be community, the appropriate community response to a disaster. Naturally, we had not thought of health disasters, although we had, you know, passingly referred to the possibility of epidemics um, as well. Nevertheless, this this became this came in very handy, um, and there was this legacy of the whole decentralization experience in Kerala, 
where you know when panchayati raj came out kerala was one state which went into full fledged full throated devolution of responsibilities powers and resources which meant functionary you transferred institutions so the health institutions at the local level were transferred to local governments the functionaries of the uh, at the local level were transferred to local governments and the local governments have uh, 25% of the entire plan budget is available as funds for local governments to plan and this is over and above the plans that they raise through internal uh, um, resources um their their uh, taxation and licensing and all of that so you it need it needs to be seen that you had fairly empowered local governments which were at work here um so with this what was it that the local governments were made to do it helped of course that we had the uh, chief minister and the opposition leader had address all the local governments in the state through video conferencing facility to get them uh, to talk them through what was expected of them so we start off with you know in the early days it was about stakeholder engagement it was about as uh, professor epen had mentioned the break the chain campaign which was the physical distancing um and uh, so this uh, uh, sensitization well, how you do the break the chain campaign mobilization of volunteers um and targeting uh, vulnerable groups so you targeted the slum dweller the fishers migrant labor and here we call them guest workers so it will be saying guest workers from our guest workers as well as their employers um targeting um uh, senior citizens and people with comorbidities because they would be they were seen as highly vulnerable communities targeting care homes and care providers because again by which you of so kerala has a very strong system perhaps the strongest of palliative care community led palliative care so targeting them because they would also be both the care um, the, the the person receiving care and the caregiver were at risk and then the delivery boys so you know the restaurateurs the auto rickshaw drivers the, the delivery boys all of these people were also seen as um points of high contact and therefore vulnerable and messages had gone out on how you do the break the chain campaign with all of these people so this was one very important intervention early intervention that was done by local governments and then of course uh, the nipa uh, based contact tracing the aggressive structural response for contact tracing so um at that point of time every person who was coming in from outside um was you know you had their contacts identified so the primary contacts and secondary contacts to give you a sense of proportion for a, for every person who was identified as as perhaps a suspect um their primary and secondary contacts were identified and more, the, once these people turned positive the others had to go into quarantine so which meant that we were looking at about 70 to 80 people um for one every every one uh, suspect of uh, of positive case who was hospitalized and at a point in time we had gone up to more than you know 2.5 lakh people who are under home observation voluntary observation but this was done and this was monitored tracked by the local governments how did they do it they had rapid response teams on the ground and this was followed up by uh, ward level committees now there are about 20000 wards so every ward basically had ward level committees of course in the early days it was only about um, 20 to 30% of the wards of the state had to um, had home isolation cases today however we've got um, we because we are doing daily tracking 75% of um, all the wards of the state have ward level committees and have cases of home isolation and quarantine that's the extent of quarantine we have right now the numbers are touching uh, 1.2 lakh so that's you know 120000 uh, over 120000 people are under home quarantine um, today so this data was also entered shared now november in in kerala all the local governments are, are uh, you know connected are internet enabled they've been doing a lot of their work online so once this happened it was important and they you know the conversations um the their meetings also started going online instead of doing regular physical i mean meetings with people uh, coming together physically they uh, the, the meetings got to be online help desks were set up and phone numbers provided so the that kind of arrangement had been done 
And this is, I'm talking about all across all the local governments, urban, rural, um, which is again a characteristic of the, of the pandemic here, that we, you know, you don't really have an urban hotspot. The, uh, today we have about 102 hotspots of which only about five or six of them are urban. The rest of them are actually in the local, in the rural areas. So there is an urban rural continuum, which you would see here. So um, now looking at what was the lockdown response of local governments, we would be talking of um, A, doing a complete survey, local survey of vulnerable high-risk persons, um, guest workers, setting up our community kitchens, which Benny talked about, managing the guest worker camps, because once people started coming out, you looked at uh, the guest workers camp, you did an assessment there, and then you also looked at where the facilities were not good or where they seemed to be unhappy with it. They were moved to uh, government facilities. We first provided them with food out of the community kitchen and realized that they didn't want cooked food. They wanted provisions. So then we immediately shifted to provisions for them. Uh, the community kitchens also catered to stranded people and destitutes because the lockdown had, uh, um, you know, kept a lot, got a lot of, froze a lot of people midway. So, uh, handling all those people who didn't have an address or anywhere to go, taking them off the road, giving them, keeping them safe was important. Lifting of rations and coordinating the entire food kit delivery, um, which was done to, uh, to, to, which was available to uh, most all ration card holders. The distance response too, because you had calls saying that I'm run out of medicine and I, I'm, I'm a kidney patient. Uh, and I need uh, uh, my medicine. So organizing that, the medicine supply, there could have been personal emergency, somebody at a death somewhere was unable to travel. So working uh, on that and also hunger calls, you know, you, you might have from affluent families, um, senior citizens' families who, you know, suddenly the maid stopped coming to work. Suddenly there was no ration, there was no food in the house and they couldn't, you know, they, they also needed to be responded to. So that kind of thing. Uh, plus organizing the disbursement of social security pensions, which was mentioned. Um, and then came the COVID care centers, which are our quarantine centers, you know, the inventorization, preparation, management of these centers under the ages of the local government. Um, and now we are also getting ready for preparation of the first line treatment centers. In case there is a surge anywhere, we don't want the hospital systems to be overwhelmed and that's going to be done by the local governments. And of course, manufacture of and distribution of uh, mass sanitizer soap, but also the disposal, because that is again a question of, now you had a lot of biomedical waste which was getting generated, and how do you dispose of that safely? Waste management, of course, plus the fact that, you know, rents, license fees, other dues had to be waived, which meant that the uh, local governments were eating very heavily into their own resources. And that's when the government decided to free up the planned funds um, for all these purposes as well. Now, the, there's a post-lockdown response also. You know, once the, the restrictions got lifted, people were suddenly hit with the realization that, you know, you could be in for food insecurity in the days to come. Kerala is a consumer state. It's uh, and dependent heavily on other states for food uh, and food materials. So now we find that there is a, a huge audience out there, a, a target group out there, who wants to cultivate in their homesteads. And um, so it has launched a, uh, a program for food security and augmentation of local productivity. Hopefully that will also lead to employment generation, um, which is fallow land and homestead cultivation, uh, homestead cultivation, focus on milk, egg, meat, inland fish production, value addition as well by way of uh, uh, activities providing technical support systems to, um, to make all of this happen, converging the schemes of all these various departments under the ages of the local governments, augmentation of local procurement as well as the local market facilities. Um, and we are expecting a huge influx of people from the Gulf, unemployed people, people who've lost their jobs. So looking at absorption of this new unemployed and financially stressed people into productive activity. So, all of that right now, local governments are very seriously engaged with. So putting local governments on hold there and moving on to Kudumbastri, where does uh, the Kudumbastri network and the community network come into all of this? So um, to explain what Kudumbastri is, it's a federated structure of self-help groups. We call them, we call them neighborhood groups. 
um, who have been federated at the ward level into ADA development societies and at the at the local government level um, as what is known as community development societies or CDS. And these are federated, so it's all women uh, run um, structures. So it's a, it's an so 4.4 million women are in this in this network, and that means 4.4 million families are linked in that, which was what you were mentioning about 60 percent. Therefore, of Kerala's families are inside. One of the first things they did, uh, uh, and, and and the importance of Kurumbisri, which and what makes it distinct from other similarly placed federations elsewhere, is is its connect with the local governments. This is the only one federated structure which is completely immersed inside the local government. So the local government has a I mean, they, they um, fill the Gram Sabhas, they are part of the working groups of the local governments. The local governments use them, uh, uh, connect with them for various activities. Um, so there is this huge synergy between the, the, the local community and the local government. W one of the things that we've been trying to do is also to make them the citizen body, you know, the voice of the citizen uh, community, the rights orientation and... and uh, Make their uh, local governments accountable to citizenship through the through a network of enabled women. Um, so that's the you know uh, there is that very very um, organic connection that the community network has, and this presence of the community network you know to give an example is that ninety five percent you know we have about twenty thousand wards, uh, both urban and rural, and ninety five percent of them have ward level structures of community network. So that's how huge the spread is universal across the state. Um, and there are also a large number of joint liability groups of farmer, women farmers. Um, there is, and, and there are some community response systems. You have a Santvinam volunteer system, which, you know, it's a system of community health workers. You've got this Nehita calling wheel, which is community counselors. You've got gender resource persons out there. Uh, and so these networks have all come into the system of the local government response. And when you look at the frontline health worker, the ASHA, most of them are from the Guru Mystery Network. So there is, again, that connect which, which comes in. So when you look at the areas in which Guru Mystery has been involved, one is the volunteer mobilization itself. So 78,000 women, 78,000 women uh, are in, um, have been mobilized as volunteers for various activities. And this is not counting the regular Kudumbasri network. And these have been, this says it's about for every gram panchayat, that is village, village body, village government, you've got about 50 women workers who have come out for, uh, for volunteering. They come into local mass production distribution. They've helped in the running of the community kitchens. They've helped in doing the home surveillance and, and uh, connecting with people under isolation. Um, they have done, community counseling. They've also been involved with disinfection and waste management. Um, they've all, th that is one area of activity. You've got community-based surveys that you talked about. So it, be it senior citizen assessment or people under palliative care or people with morbidities, guest worker camps and facilities, and even the skill set survey of the guest workers that has been done by Kunumbusri has been involved with this. The community surveillance, surveillance that I talked about, very intensive participation on their part. And, and uh, the neighborhood groups have been active in even communicating the medical needs of people who are not under observation, you know, senior citizens or people with morbidities in the locality. That information is reaching the local system through the Kurumbistri uh, network. It's, you know, one of the first things Kurumbistri did when the pandemic hit was to ensure that everybody in the network was connected to WhatsApp groups. So WhatsApp groups were created of the energies of the area development societies of the CDS so that the information flow uh, uh, would be seamless, which was, which was an in, uh, uh, incredible thing to do. So this, to start IEC activities, you needed to get into that. And, um, and then messages started going down through the um, neighborhood group network. We, uh, we had, you know, before the lockdown, we had actually planned for an entire uh, discussion of what of what to do and not to do and how to get into community surveillance to understanding of COVID from all angles. Unfortunately, we couldn't organize that because the, the weekend that we planned the, um, the, we planned the neighborhood group meetings was the, was the day we had the first lockdown instruction from, uh, from the central government, followed almost immediately by the, um, by, by the complete lockdown. So, so that didn't happen. And therefore, we had to switch into online mode almost immediately. Um, 
the competitions, you know, the activities which um, Professor Epin was talking about, we've got a, com uh, a community of children also who are associated. We call them the Balasabhas. And, you know, so keeping them engaged, getting them into activities. So TikTok, Vishu, um, competitions, organizing them so that there was Manoranjan and entertainment under lockdown and that there was also stress buster um, activities was something that uh, couldn't be sure coordinated in a, in a great way. And the series themselves, so they had their own homegrown videos, they made their own songs. You had, you had thousands of uh, Kurumbusri songs on how to, uh, you know, take some uh, popular songs and converting them into COVID response, that kind of activity. Um, so after this comes the factor of uh, economic activity and resilience. The, uh, you know, the community kitchens have now closed, but the uh, budget hotels remain. So um, Kurumbusri has out of the community kitchens too, about 400 budget hotels have been, have sprouted across the state. And we're hoping that in two months time, that's going to touch thousands, that we'll have it all over the place, which is about making affordable food available um, to, uh, uh, to people and also to service institutional quarantine and home quarantine as and when um, required and any, any distress uh, signal that comes up in collaboration with the local companies. Uh, the joint liability groups who have been geotagged and registered, they have already been about doing fallow land survey and uh, getting, um, getting involved with uh, the agricultural production activities. There's been um, an interest-free loan, this 2,000 crore loan, which was, uh, um, and, uh, which was mentioned again by Professor Epin. That has been mobilized, um, in, that is targeting Kudumbasri, uh, uh, the women of Kudumbasri, and so that interest the mobilization processing of application, again, all of this done online without, uh, without their, their being able to meet. And they've gone to the banks. Now we're trying to get the banks to get the money out. Uh, so that, that work is ongoing right now. Now, having said this, I would just like to flag a few issues. You know, all this seems very nice and hunky-dory, but there are, of course, concerns. Now, one concern is that, you know, it's... It's a thing we, uh, the state, government, and even the mission, the Kudumbasri mission, we all love to use Kudumbasri. So it is an instrument that we use at our will. Um, it is cheap later and, you know, volunteers. Now I, I had a, I heard about the joint liability groups, farm produce having been given, uh, donated to the community kitchens. And then I realized that, you know, these were people who were undergoing financial stress themselves. And of course, there must have been some level of coercion or pressure that ended up with them doing this. So you are actually making them foot the bill. Uh, and, and people who are already hit footing the bill. So these are some of the dangers that you have of this kind of mobilization and control and, and, and association. And uh, you know, we need to realize very often that this paves the way for um, somebody who's become a light space organization to slip into becoming just, a, a, you know, a, an object of patronage and instrumentality and not, and somewhere the agency is lost. And it's important right now for us to ensure that the agency is something that we are able to, uh, um, to retain or refurbish. There is the fact that we are also exposing them. They are, you know, by virtue of putting them out there in the front line, we're also making them vulnerable. So therefore, the state really needs to think in terms of insurance and protection and, and support for this, which we haven't really done at this uh, point of time. And there is this multiple burden of work and performance, which was mentioned by Dr. Ethan, so I'm not going, to the, going into that further. But one other issue, you know, Working in, in the local self-governments and their strength has been something which has enabled convergence in Kerala across departments. You know, it's something which you find not happening most of the time because of the fact that there is very strict departmentalism and, you know, uh, uh, and control. Uh, and it's a command performance usually. Disaster management is generally a command performance and it is it is no, no matter what, even here, it tends to being a command performance. But what command performance is, 
do is that they leave the ground open for uh, command structures to come into place. And it's very important to uh, guard against that. When we talk convergence, the, uh, you know, local governments are working on convergence, but then there is a problem of association between various departments and various wings of government, of the elected body and the, um, and the uh, various uh, officers, of the officers in the community. And very often the burden of handling all that, of managing all that falls on the community. And that is an extremely severe stress point. Uh, we know that we, we can see that fatigue hitting and we are just wondering how do we, you know, how do we bring them out of this? How do we um, keep them resilient in the words of, again, Professor Raven. Thank you.